hello everyone let us look at the two dimensional signals and systems we have seen what is a signal already signal is a dependent variable which varies with respect to one or more independent variables in particular image is a two dimensional signal whose independent variables are cartesian coordinates they are nothing but the spatial coordinates image can be a one channel signal or a three channel signal if it is a grayscale image then it is a one channel signal if it is a color image then it will have three channels namely red green and blue we have seen this in the previous classes what we are going to do in this course we are going to discuss about typical two dimensional signals and systems because we are working on a two dimensional signal and in order to understand the mathematics of the two dimensional signals and systems first we will see the one dimensional signal and then we will extend it to the two dimensional case for doing that we need a specific concept which is called as separable separability separable functions function f of x comma y is called separable if it can be written as f of x comma y is equal to f1 of x multiplied with f2 of y here f1 of x and f2 of y are two one dimensional functions f1 of x depends only on x and f2 of y depends only on y that two individual one dimensional functions so f of x comma y can now be separated into two functions product of two functions f1 of x and f2 of y this is very important in particular for us let us look at the elementary two dimensional signals we have one dimensional direct delta function discrete case delta of n is equal to 1 for n equal to 0 and it is equal to 0 otherwise for two dimensional case it's a separable function we have delta of m comma n is equal to delta of m multiplied with delta of n which means that delta of m comma n equal to 1 if m is equal to n is equal to 0 it is equal to 0 otherwise the next elementary signal is unit step signal Unit step signal for one dimensional case is u of n is equal to 1 for n greater than or equal to 0, otherwise, it is equal to 0. For two dimensional case, we will have a separable function u of m, comma n, which is equal to u of m multiplied with u of n, which results in 1 if m, comma n greater than or equal to 0, otherwise, it is equal to 0. Now, what is a system? A system is a mathematical relation between the input and output where the output is more meaningful form of the input or more meaningful means more desirable for us or you can say it's a physical device which takes one or more inputs and results in at least one output so we have let us say an input signal as x of n y of n is the output signal so y of n is equal to transformation on x of n transformation means an operation on x of Two dimensional case y of m comma n is equal to transformation on x of m comma n which means that f of y of m comma n is a function of x of m comma n that is impulse response of a system response of the system when the excitation is impulse this is uh, response of the system not input response of the system when the input excitation is impulse is called as impulse response of the system and is represented by h of m comma n in memory of the heavy side so if i apply delta of m comma n the output of the system is impulse response of the system which is h of m comma n so h of m comma n is equal to transformation on delta of m comma n this transformation is something related to system we are not interested in all types of systems we are interested in particular types of system the reason is simple for L lti or lsi system we know how to compute the output in terms of the input and impulse response of the system in the other cases it's a bit difficult to compute the response of the system for a given input so what is an lsi system or lti system in general 
LTI, you know, the time invariance they call it in continuous case and shift invariance they call it in discrete case. So, what is linearity? First of all, linearity. Uh, okay, a system is said to be linear if it obeys two properties, namely homogeneity and superposition. What do we mean by homogeneity? If I apply x of m comma n and the corresponding output is y of m comma n, and I scale the input by a scaling factor y, which is a scalar a of x a into x of m comma n, then the corresponding output should be a into y of m comma n. What is the significance of this? Let us say a equal to zero, which means that the input is equal to zero. In that case, because the output should be a into y of m comma n, the output is also supposed to be zero. So homogeneity, you know, it if if a system is obeying homogeneity, then it should follow zero input producing zero output. Okay, homogeneity means a scalar factor in the input will result in the same scaling factor in the output. Now, what is superposition? If I have an input x1 of m comma n and the corresponding output as y1 of m comma n and another input x2 of m comma n the corresponding output as y2 of m comma n then if I apply the sum of the two inputs x1 of m comma n plus x2 of m comma n and the corresponding output should be sum of the responses of the individual inputs to the system which is y1 of m comma n plus y2 of m comma n. Clubbing these two, we can write it as a into x1 of m comma n plus b into x2 of m comma n should result in a into y1 of m comma n plus b into y2 of m comma n. What is time invariance? A delay, a delay in the input should result in the same delay in the output. Then the system is called as time invariant system. What is the significance of this? A delay in the input should not distort the output. That is the importance of time invariance. So, if a system obeys both linearity and time invariance, then we call that system as linear time invariant system. In discrete case, we generally call it as linear shift invariant system (LSI system). Now, what is the relation between input and output of an LSI system? This is what we are trying to derive. Let us say delta of n is the impulse we apply to the system an LSA system then the corresponding output is h of n and let us say I apply delta of n minus k as the input then the corresponding output is h of n minus k the reason is the system is shift invariant system a delay in the input should produce same delay in the output for delta of n the output is h of n and hence for delta of n minus k the output should be h of n minus k. Next thing is if I apply x of k into delta of n minus k, the output should be x of k into h of n minus k. Why is that? Because the system obeys homogeneity. Yes, this is independent of n, you can see. So this is simply a scalar with respect to n. A scalar factor in the input should result in the same scaling factor in the output. So x of k multiplied with delta of n minus k should produce x of k multiplied with h of n minus k. Now, summation over k equal to minus infinite to infinite x of k multiplied with delta of n minus k will produce summation over k equal to minus infinite to infinite x of k into h of n minus k. This is because the system follows superposition. So this is summation of various inputs which is resulting in summation of the corresponding outputs if you see this is nothing but your x of n itself x of n written as sum of impulses we are we already very familiar with this and the corresponding output let us say it is y of n so y of n is equal to summation over k equal to minus infinite to infinite x of k into h of n minus k this is called as superposition sum or our favorite convolution. Let us see an example of one dimensional convolution. We are particularly interested in finite length discrete signals. So let us consider x of n 
the input to be one to one and the impulse response of the system to be one minus one so x of n equal to one to one with, with a zero at two and h of n is equal to one comma minus one with a zero at one here now y of n is convolution of x of n with h of n so let us expand and see y of n is equal to summation over k equal to minus infinite infinite x of k multiplied with h of n minus k which is also equal to summation over k equal to minus infinite to infinite h of k multiplied with x of n minus k it is because so you know the convolution obeys commutative property let us try to see where y of n will actually start the starting index of the output sequence is obtained by sum of the starting indices of the input sequence and the impulse response of the system sx is equal to minus 1 in this case and sh, sh is equal to 0 where sx is the starting index of the sequence x of n and sh is the starting sequence of uh, h of n so the resulting sequence will start at minus 1 plus 0 which is minus 1 similarly the ending index is obtained by the sum of uh, the ending indices of the two sequences x of n and h of n in this case the ending index is equal to 1 plus 1 which is equal to 2 the length of the res resulting sequence is given by nx plus nh minus 1 where nx is the length of x of n and nh is the length of h of n and ny is the length of uh, the resulting sequence y of n so the uh, for the current prob for the current uh, problem we have uh, x of n of uh, length 3 and h of n of length 2 so the resulting sequence will have 3 plus 2 minus 1 which is 4 and the resulting sequence will start at minus 1 and it will end at 2 so the sequence y of n is equal to y of minus 1 comma y of 0 comma y of 1 comma y of 2 so let us compute this samples actually so y of minus 1 is obtained by summation over k equal to minus infinite to infinite x of k into h of n minus k which is equal to summation over k equal to minus infinite to infinite x of k multiplied with h of n minus k so let us try to expand this expression so we know that x of k is non-zero only for k equal to minus 1 to k equal to 1 so here k equal to minus 1 to 1 only I am considering in the summation because all the other terms are going to be become 0 as x of k equal to 0 except in this range so this let, let us expand this x of minus 1 multiplied with h of minus 1 minus of uh, minus 1 which is minus 1 plus 1 which is equal to h of 0 plus and when k equal to 0 this is x of 0 and this is h of minus 1 and then when k equal to 1 this is x of 1 and this is h of minus 2 so i have written the corresponding values and computed it there is one interesting thing here just add these two if i add these two i will get uh, k plus n minus k k k will get cancelled i will get n which is the n which is present here so if i am computing y of minus 1 and if i am summing up the these two indices that are present uh, inside you know x of k and h of n minus k they should always result in n so y of minus 1 i am computing minus 1 plus 0 is minus 1 0 plus minus 1 is again minus 1 1 plus minus 2 is again minus 1 so this is a self check for you to avoid mistakes in computing the convolution so this is how you can compute all the other values also for y of minus 2 y of minus sorry y of 0 y of 1 and y of 2 so we can to compute the other terms like this y of minus 1 expanded uh, in terms of uh, x of k and h of n minus k and y of 0 is this y of 1 is this y of 2 is this we just need to you know replace n with the corresponding value here n is equal to 0 so i have replaced that we got h of minus k here and if i y of 1 here then uh, h of 1 minus k is what i'm going to get y of 2 h of 2 minus k is what i'm going to get as i said the indices uh, some of these two indices should always result in uh, the index which is present here 
minus 1 plus 1 is 0, 0 plus 0 is 0, 1 minus 1 is 0. And for this case, minus 1 plus 2 it is 1, 0 plus 1 is 1, 1 plus 0 it is 1, vice versa. And you can see there is a similarity, you know, here I have x of minus 1 everywhere, this term is x of 0 and this term is x of 1. If you see here, h of 0, h of 1, h of 2, h of 3, so this index which is inside h is incremented by 1 and here h of minus 1, h of 0, h of 1, h of 2 again the same thing, the indices is incremented by 1 but when compared with the previous uh, you know coefficient uh, this is uh, decremented by 1 similarly here also this is decre decremented by 1 when compared with the previous thing so there, is, there are similarities that are present here uh, uh, which we can uh, explore uh, further when we look into the matrix method. So let us uh, move on and see the important thing graphical convolution. We are, uh, we, we, we will uh, compute this uh, convolution again. Y of n is equal to summation over k equal to minus infinite to infinite x of k into h of n minus k. I was talking about, uh, you know, if both uh, the signals are uh, of finite length, uh, then we will have uh, y of n also to be finite length and uh, how to compute uh, the starting index and uh, ending in this index of uh, y of n we have seen. So how did we get that? Let us uh, actually look at that. So I uh, have written x of k just v plus n with k that's what I have done. x of k is this and h of k is this. Now because we need to compute h of n minus k, h of n minus k you no know, First, let us see h of minus k. h of minus k is simply the time reversal of this. And then h of n minus k, see, I need to shift this by n. So, this is n here and this is minus. Yeah, there's a mistake here. This is uh, a minus 1 here, not 1. So, how do we compute uh, y of n? First, we need to compute x of k and then h of n minus k. Then multiply the corresponding samples then sum up for k. I'm repeating f n is equal to summation over k to minus infinite to infinite x of k into h of n minus k. The first thing to multiply you know, sample wise substituting uh, value of n x of k multiplied with h of n minus k. So the corresponding samples are multiplying then summing up all such products. So I need to multiply these two the corresponding samples and then add over all k. So let us compute y of minus 1 first. y of minus 1, v plus n with minus 1 here. We will get uh, this h of minus 1 minus k to start with the minus 2 and to end with minus 1. So uh, I am trying to multiply the corresponding samples. Here uh, at 1 I have a 1 and here at 1 I have 0. And here at 0 I have 2 and here at 0 I have 0. At minus 1 I have 1 and at minus 1 I have 1. So if I multiply these two, the, the corresponding value is 1. At minus 2, I have the value to be 0, and at uh, minus 2, the, I have the value of minus 1. So 0 multiplied with minus 1 is 0. So y of minus 1 is equal to 1. Let us see what happens if I compute h of minus 2 minus k. h of minus 2 minus k, uh, this will become minus 2 here, and uh, this will become minus 3 and uh, you can see h of x of minus 2 is 0 so there is no overlapping of uh, non-zero values between x of k and h of minus 2 and minus k hence y of n is equal to 0 the overlapping will start from n equal to minus 1 only okay i'm repeating so if i shift this signal one more by one more sample towards left then this sequence is starting from minus 1 and this sequence is starting from you know, the, the sequence is uh, ending uh, minus 2 in that case. H of minus 2 minus k will end at minus 2. Hence, there is no overlapping region where both, you know, both the samples are non-zero. That is why we are starting at y of minus 1. And y of 0 can be similarly computed by shifting this first and then multiply the corresponding values and then summing up the values. And y of 1 similarly can be computed by Shifting this by one sample, then multiply the corresponding samples and then adding adding up. So what we do for computing convolution? First fold the signal, 
after folding shift multiply add then shift multiply add then shift multiply add till the last sample shift multiply add this is what we are going to do so this is the convolution for you what we did we have taken uh, the corresponding you know we have obtained x of k and h of n minus k then we have multiplied corresponding samples add them up to get the you know the value that we are computing so this is graphical convolution for you now the matrix method i have told you there are some similarities that we can explore so this y of n i have written as a y of n you know i will call that vector as y y is equal to y of minus 1 y of 0 y of 1 and y of 2 and uh, this x also I have written as a vector the input vector x of minus 1 x of 0 and x of 1 now i want to express y matrix as a matrix multiplied with uh, the vector x so how do how do we do that here we can see x of minus 1 the quotient of x of minus 1 is h of 0 the quotient of x of 0 is h of minus 1 the quotient of h of minus 2 is x of 1 so i am writing that here quotient of h of x of minus 1 is h of 0 quotient of x of 0 is h of minus 1 quotient of x of 1 is h of minus 2 so how do i obtain y of minus 1 by multiplying this row vector with this column vector i will get the first uh, sample in this i will get the second sample in this uh, by multiplying the second row with this column vector similarly i can get uh, the next two elements in the vector y so i, I just need to write uh, the quotients of uh, x of minus 1 x of 0 and x of 1 you know in these expressions so this is what we did we have written y as a vector and x as a vector then based on the quotients we have in these expressions we have considered this matrix uh, and this matrix is called as uh, you know the quotient matrix capital h represented by capital h you can see that here i, I was uh, talking about the similarities in this so this is h of 0 h of 1 h of 2 and h of 3 then the next thing next vector is h of minus 1 h of 0 h of 1 and h of 2 you can see that this is a you know uh, you can say uh, shifted version of the previous row and this is also shifted version of the sorry the shifted version of the previous column this is shifted version of the previous column and this is also shifted version of the previous column column down shifted i will say so h of 0 h of minus 1 and this h of 0 more here this h of 1 more here this h of 2 more here and h of minus 1 more here h of 0 more here h of 1 more here and the you know the empty slot is filled by the previous sample here so this is how we can write the matrix capital h i'll put it uh, in more easy easier form for you uh, just write uh, just find out the starting index ending index of uh, the output vector y and write that as uh, a vector okay then write the input vector as well in order to compute uh, the h matrix you need to do you, know, you find out how many samples that you need to pad with okay so we know that uh, if this is a 4 by 1 vector and this is a 3 by 1 vector this matrix obviously should be a 4 by 3 matrix because if i want to multiply this with this we should have uh, three columns and if it has to result in uh, four rows it has to have uh, four rows so i need to pad zeros with uh, h of uh, write down the sequence we have h of 0 and h of 1 actually i have padded two zeros here which are h of 2 and h of 3 then the next row simply you know uh, just down uh, shift it you will get the next column and for the next column you just down shift it you will get this column okay because we already know the size of this matrix it is uh, easy to know you know it, it is easy for us to know where to stop exactly you don't need to always write these expressions and find out the quotients i'm simply giving you a rule of thumb what to do just write the output vector after computing the starting index and the ending index and write uh, x of uh, the input vector x of n. then 
write this matrix after padding the number of zeros padding the number of zeros to h of n so write down that vector and down shift it and down shift it you can do that along those also shifting and all but how you know there is a, a, a caution when you are doing that that i will uh, teach you you know uh, in short future uh, what i recommend do it always along columns first write down this first column then down shift it then down shift it so have you seen this matrix anywhere this matrix if you see has constant elements along the diagonals along the main diagonal it is h of 0 along the first sub diagonal it is h of minus 1 and along the sub diagonal which is below the main diagonal it is h of 1 uh, the one which is below this having h of 2 so on so this matrix is called as a tuples matrix now we can conclude that an LSI system is represented by a tuples matrix. The tuples matrix have some peculiar properties which, which will make our lives easier to analyze an LSI system. Now, what if the input is periodic in nature? So if the input is periodic in nature, then we will have, uh, you know, and, and let us assume for the time being, the impulse response of the system is also periodic in nature. And if we convolve these two signals, then we will have an infinite length signal, which is also repeating itself, which I mean to say, which is also a periodic signal. So what we can do, we can, instead of observing the entire signal, if we can observe only one period one period of the signal then it is sufficient for us to analyze you know to know about the entire signal because the same thing is repeat is going to repeat itself after every one period right so that is the reason instead of instead of observing the entire signal from minus infinite to infinite we will take one period of the signal of both the x of n and h of n and then convolve the two things in order to get the output sequence which is uh, again confined to that one period this is called as periodic convolution or circular convolution now i'll put put more interesting insight into this where we will have an infinite i mean to say a periodic signals a periodic signal where we will have naturally available we may get quasi periodic signals but periodic signals are a bit difficult to get in nature naturally so what we then why we are discussing about this at all the reason is that we will never process the signal from minus infinite to infinite at once what we do we take a frame of a signal and then process it i will explain you about this more in detail when we go to the transforms image transform which is the third chapter we'll uh, move forward okay so now what we are going to discuss we are going to discuss about periodic convolution periodic convolution is all about take one period of uh, x of uh, n and h of n both are both we are assuming that they are periodic and compute their convolution over one period what is the main difference that we will get here because having periodic signals here they are going to repeat itself and when we are moving from k equal to 0 to n minus 1 we will definitely get some samples which are not in the range of 0 to n minus 1 they may go less than zero or they may go depending on the value of k they may go beyond capital n so we need to do what we are going to do we are going to remap those signals we are going to remap those samples back into the range of zero to n minus one how we can do that we know that for a periodic signal we will have x of n is equal to x of n plus r minus m into capital n 
where m belongs to the integer so if we have a sample which is uh, less than zero then just uh, add capital n if we have n greater than capital n then we will we are going to subtract capital n so this will make always this index h of uh, x of you know this index k and n minus k specifically n minus k be in the range of 0 to n minus 1 always it is possible because we are assuming that h of n is periodic so what is modulo n operation i have almost explained you explained to you already a signal which repeats itself after n samples which is where n is greater than 0 is called a periodic signal with periodicity n as the signal is repeating for every n samples it is sufficient to see n samples rather than to get the signal from minus infinite to infinite we can always map the other samples into 0 to n minus 1 range because we have x of n is equal to x of n plus or minus m into capital n so let us look into one, one more interesting thing that is circular reversal x of minus n modulo n is called as circular reversal how it is different from uh, normal time reversal that we do we will see that so x of minus n modulo n is x of 0 modulo n x of minus 1 modulo n x of minus 2 modulo n x of minus 0 or plus 0 it is x of 0 itself and this is the range of 0 to n minus 1 now x of minus 1 modulo n this minus 1 is not in the range of 0 to n minus 1 what I am going to do? I am just going to add capital N to this. The value of capital N here is 3. 3 minus 1 we will have x of 2. Similarly for x of minus 2 we will have x of 1. So what is the modulo you know, circular reversal of this? x of uh, minus n modulo 3 is given by x of 0, x of 2, x of 1. What about the natural, you no, know, the linear time reversal? The linear time reversal will have x of minus 2, x of minus 1, and x of 0. So, this is the difference between circular reversal and linear reversal, linear time reversal. Okay. So, let us move on. Let us see an example of circular convolution. So, x of n is equal to 1 to 1 and h of n is equal to 1 minus 1. Now, the first thing to do is to find out the starting index and ending index. That is what we have done in the linear convolution. In circular convolution, the starting index will be 0 always and the ending index will be capital N minus 1 always where capital N is periodic periodicity of the signal because we are going to get y of n again back in the same period and the length of y of n will be same as the length of x of n and h of n. Here we can see length of x of n and h of n are different. Then what we are going to do? We are going to take the maximum of the lengths of these two and then make the length of both the signals be max of the length of x of n h of n. We can see here n y is equal to max of n x comma n h. So n x is 3 n h is 2. The maximum of these two is 3. So what we are going to do? We are going to pad 1 0 to h of n. And again what is the formula for this? y of n is equal to summation over k equal to 0 to n minus 1 x of k into h of n minus k modulo n so summation over k for finding out y of 0 let us substitute n equal to 0 summation over equal to 0 to 2 x of k into when n is equal to 0 we will have h of minus k modulo 3 and we will expand this k equal to 0 this is x of 0 into h of 0 plus when k equal to 1 this is x of 1 into h of minus 1 modulo 3 and then uh, when x equal to 2 this is x of 2 into h of minus 2 modulo 3. What is the value of h of minus 1 modulo 3? h of 3 minus 1 which is h of 2. That's I have substituted here. And h of minus 2 modulo 3 is h of 1. That I have also substituted. If you substitute the values of uh, x of 0, x of 1 and you know the remaining things what I got is 0 here. Similarly can also find out what is y of 1, y of 2, so on. Okay. Uh, yeah. Now, uh, 
similarly what we have done in the previous no uh, previously for linear convolution we have written uh, this expression in terms of uh, no matrix multiplication so the same thing we are going to do let us write the y matrix first y vector first length of the y vector will be maximum of uh, x comma x right so uh, what we have the length of this as 3 by 1 and the length of the input vector is 3 by 1 so we will have this matrix to be 3 by 3 right so if i want to get a 3 by 1 here then i should have the matrix size to be 3 and if i want to get if i want to multiply this with this then matrix size you know, the number of uh, columns in this should be same as the number of rows in this so the size of this matrix is 3 by 3 then the quotients if you see h of 0 h of 2 and h of 1 and for obtaining y of 1 we will be multiplying this you know, this row with this one and the corresponding quotients will be h of 1 h of 0 h of 2 similarly for y of 2 the quotients are h of 2 h of 1 h of 0 have you seen this matrix anywhere? This matrix is of course SI filament matrix. So we can see H of 0, H of 1, H of 2. The next column will be H of 2 going here and down shifting H of 0, H of 1. This is called a circular shift. Okay. H of 2 go will H of 2 will go upward and these two will get downwards. And H of 1 is going upward again. And this is going to get here. See what is a circular matrix? Any row or any column can be obtained by circular shift by one of the previous row and column so we can see each row and column are previous you know circular shift of the previous row and column great now why i have told you right you if you remember i always asked you to do the shifting you know write the columns of the matrix first you now you can see that here h of 0 h of 1 h of 2 and circular reversal of this then circular reversal of this if i want to do it along uh, rows then you can see we have to compute that circular reversal first here you are getting h of 0 h of 2 h of 1 okay so this circular reversal you have to compute and then write it as the first row of the matrix because what we are going to have here as a quotient vector is h of minus k of modulo 3 so circular reversal is what we need to write as the first row of this matrix in order to avoid this you know computation of the circular reversal i have asked you to write always along columns so h of 0 h of 1 h of 2 i have simply written write down that column vector and then you know did this circular shift okay so that is the caution i wanted to tell you in the previous no linear convolution for linear convolution you can do it either way you can write along columns or rows but here you better you know do it along columns so that's in order to avoid all the confusions i have always you know instructed you to do it along columns this is a rule of thumb okay just write down the vector determining the size of this matrix at the number of uh, the required number of zero to the h vector and then simply do the down shifting in the case of linear convolution and in the case of circular convolution do the circular shift in order to get this matrix so now we can see uh, for one dimensional case how to compute linear convolution using circular convolution uh, using if we want to do that determine what is the length of the resulting vector from linear convolution the length of the resulting vector from the linear convolution will be x plus nh minus 1 so what we are going to do we are going to pad nh minus 1 number of 0 to x of n and nh minus 1 number of uh, sorry nx minus 1 number of zeros to h of n so after padding the required number of zeros simply compute the circular convolution so you can see here we have computed nx plus nh minus 1 and that we got it as 4 so i have padded 1 0 to x of n and 2 zeros to h of n so now this is x of 1 vector 1 2 1 0 and h of n i have padded 1 minus 1 0 0 so what we need to do for computing circular convolution write down column first so this vector i am going to write it as 
first column and do circular shift again do circular shift again do circular shift if i do it one more time i'll get back this vector so we will easily know easily know where to stop actually also so now we can see we got our matrix right and multiply it with this in order to get this vector so this is how we can compute linear convolution using circular convolution now how to compute the circular convolution using linear convolution so to do this okay uh, complete, compute linear convolution and fold the resulting sequence to match the length to max of nx comma and h we know that from linear convolution we will get the length of linear convolution to be nx plus nh minus 1 so in order to get circular convolution from linear convolution you know from circular convolution we will get max of nh nx comma nh where nx is length of x sequence and nh is length of h sequence so in we know from linear convolution we will get that you know few extra samples these extra samples what we are going to do we are going to fold the signal at max of nx comma nh and add to the remaining signal see i have got here 1 1 minus 1 minus 1 length of y of n is expected to be t so i am going to add this sample to this let us say if i have one more sample here then i am going to add this sample to this okay i don't have so i didn't add that so if i get minus 1 plus 1 here i am going to get a 0 here 1 minus 1 let us see if it is correct or not okay we have already computed the uh, the circular convolution of this sequences so the circular convolution of these sequences okay uh, we have not done i think okay first sample at least we have computed the first sample we got it as zero okay so the remaining samples also we can compute and see you know the circular convolution is actually zero one and minus one okay i think we'll end this session here no okay we have a two-dimensional case as well okay for the two dimensional case let us obtain what is the relation between the input and the output of a linear shift invariant system when the input is delta of m comma n the output is h of m comma n which is the impulse response of the system I have a shift along a row by m naught and shift along the column by n naught then the output you know the response of the system will also be delayed by m naught and n naught respectively along rows and columns now i am going to multiply this with a constant x of m naught comma n naught this is going to give me x of m naught comma n naught multiplied with h of m minus m naught comma n minus n naught this is because shift invariance property of the lsi system and this is because homogeneity property obeyed by linear shift invariant system and now i'll do m not from minus infinite to infinite and n not is also varying from minus infinite to infinite these two summations i'm going to do now by superposition principle the output will also be a summation of the responses of the individual inputs so this is the corresponding output that i got In that case we have m comma n equal to summation over m not equal to minus infinite to infinite not equal to minus infinite to infinite x of m not comma n not multiplied with h of m minus m not multi comma n minus m not this is called as two dimensional convolution the output of an lsi system is again convolution you know it is the convolution of the input of the system with the impulse response of the system. We'll end this session here.